morning, we're moving to uh, really in our study of the Pauline prayers, and this is probably our, our last one on the Pauline prayers, and after that I'm thinking of stepping through some of the Psalms and, and walking through, because uh, the Psalms are songs and prayers, all right, so they have a little bit of both, and in fact expand the gamut of, of, the, uh, of emotions in terms of God's people in the midst of life and a sin-cursed world and their expression of confidence in God and, and their petitioning of God, so we are going to take some time walk through some of the prayers found in Psalms after we finish this. And uh, Carson in his book on spiritual refor- on prayer, uh, reforming our prayer life uh, it makes this statement. He said, prayer is not like a good recipe. Simply follow a set of mechanical directions and everything turns out right in the end. Uh, and you know what you mean by that. There are plenty of people who have taken the Lord's Prayer, the Disciples' Prayer, or however you want to title it. And they repeat it, wrote, and think, well, that's what praying is. Or you've learned some other set prayer, and you pray that all the time. I remember a few years ago, I remember the book Prayer of Jabez. Anybody remember that book? Okay, it kind of caught wildfire. It was spreading everywhere. And so the prayer of Jabez came, and that was like the, if you would pray that prayer, then you're going to have your boundaries expanded. You know, it's like this magic formula prayer, and it took fire, and really all it did was make Bruce Wilkinson a lot of money. Honestly, that's all it did. Because there is not a magic formula prayer, and if you're looking for the magic formula prayer so you can rub your magic genie God and get out what you desire, no such prayer exists. Okay? Because that's not what prayer is about. And so when we study Paul's prayers, we're not studying them like, okay, if I can just learn to pray the words Paul prayed, then I'm going to see the results Paul saw. Okay, that is not, I hope you have not concluded from anything I have said that that is what I've suggested, that you can simply learn to mimic the words of Paul and see the results Paul saw, Um, because that would be false, and I would just say it this way, our prayer lives must be driven by relationship, not a formula. Driven by a relationship, that our time in the Word is meant to be a time with God, Not a time to check, do a checklist. Not a time to mark off today on my spiritual disciplines. I needed to read the word. I read the word. Amen. Onward forward. I need to pray, so I pray and I have my set prayer list or my set prayer agenda and I pray through that every day the same way. Uh, You don't talk to everybody the same way every day, right? You have a relationship with them. So if you said just the same thing, men, by the way, here's a good little tip. When you're telling your wife you love her, I hope you do, but I hope you vary the ways you tell her you love her and even the pitch with which you use because she's going to drone out that real quick. Okay, all you're doing is saying that same pat phrase every morning. Okay, show me, don't just tell me. And uh, so... Here, I mean, we communicate, and our communications vary because the relationship varies and circumstances vary. Now, here's the good news. The God we're praying to doesn't change. Okay, that's really good news. He doesn't change, and amazingly, his love for sinners like you and I and his commitment to your good doesn't change. That's incredible. I mean, I wish I could say my commitment to the good of people I love never changed. You know, I never, never, I always wanted only good for them. I never did anything that might have been, been, been self-oriented to try and get something good from them rather than do good to them, all right? God of heaven does not change, all right? His, his intentionality to do good in the lives of his children has never changed, and it will not change. And so what changes is you and I are changing, sometimes for the good and sometimes not. Nobody in here is static. Your relationship with God is not static. And I, and I hope, I mean, we've taught about that before, but I just remind you of that again. Your, your relationship with God is not stationary. It's always moving. It's either moving forward or backwards, always. Okay? Every day, even every moment of the day, either I am increasing in my relationship with God and my dependence on God, or I'm moving towards independence. Okay? And that's in the busyness of life. I know busyness of life tends to move us towards independence. Because we don't keep God at the center of our thoughts in the busyness of life. It's very easy to do, okay? But we're always moving one direction or another. And that's just a part of our prayer life. And so our prayer life should be more dynamic than stationary, okay? It should not be static. It's not just the same thing. Uh, it shouldn't just be the same language all the time. We're not looking for magic formula. We are coming to expose our hearts before God. And why not? He already knows it. You're not hiding anything from him. 
There's not one thing going on in your heart, not one struggle that he doesn't already know. There's not one thought he, hasn't already, he already knows. So we're coming before God, and we really are exposing our hearts before God because we really need God to help expose our hearts to ourselves, don't we? We really need God to help us see what's going on in our hearts better than we perceive it ourselves. And we need God to change these hearts of ours, grant us grace that overcomes sin, because if that doesn't happen, we'll be overrun by sin. That's reality, okay? Because I don't have the strength to defeat sin, and you don't either. It's not the way salvation works. Salvation brought you into the, a relationship with God as a child who's dependent on your father. And the good news, he's always promised to provide you the strength you need so you don't have to give up to temptation, right? He's always promised it. Now, we don't always come availing ourselves, nor do we always have confidence in God or confidence in his goodness because we, again, are always moving in a direction towards or away. And so that's the dynamic of prayer. And so our prayer life should not be static. And even as we're going to look tonight, we're really looking at uh, Paul's request of prayer. And he's going to request prayer from the believers in Rome. And in that, we're going to ultimately look at some lessons about praying for ministry. And we won't look at all of them tonight, but I just kind of set in a direction of what these prayer requests is going. In fact, it's found near the end of Romans 15 and verse 30, but we're going to start earlier in there because there's some important contextual information that leads us up to his prayer request that we need to see. But then I'm going to I'm going to weigh into some observations in the earlier part of that, and that may be our time tonight, and we may not even really get into the prayer request, uh, or we may just step into it a little bit, okay? But so I'm going to look at Romans chapter 15, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and read the whole section, and then we're going to focus our attention back to verses 14 uh, through 16. Paul writes, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I've written you very boldly by way of reminder, because the grace of God given by me, of grace of God given me by God, or the grace, excuse me, I can read, because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. If Jesus Christ, then, in Jesus Christ, then, I, I, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Achillium, uh, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain." And to be helped on my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints in, at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owed it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in spiritual blessings, they ought to be of service to them in material blessings. When, therefore, I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in fullness of the blessings of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So we look at this text, we're going to start with just some observations, going back to verse 14. And the question I just asked, and whoops, I guess I already had it up there, sorry. Uh, what, what is Paul convinced, and really, in, in fact, in the translation there, as he says, I'm satisfied, uh, and his word is often translated persuaded, to be fully convinced. So Paul is satisfied or convinced about something in regard to the character of these believers. And he mentions two things there. What are they? 
All right, so that they're full of goodness. And then he says not only are they full of goodness, but they're also filled with knowledge of God. And if the verb translated there, as I mentioned about being a, actually, I'm sorry, in the, the verb translate, or the word translated to be filled, now it, it, here's an interesting thing, and this is, I got a couple of my Greek students, fledgling Greek students, my couple year Greek students not here tonight, no, she doesn't feel well, but anyway, uh, there's a, a perfect passive participle here. Now, all my fledgling Greek students have no idea what a perfect is or a passive voice. A perfect is a tense, and the perfect is a tense of a verb that simply speaks of something that happened in the past that has an abiding reality to it. So when he says you've been filled, he's saying there's a filling that took place in the past. Something happened that caused them to be filled with goodness, and they continue to be filled with goodness, okay? That's the idea of the verb. So the perfect tense makes a big deal here, all right? It's a passive. A passive means they didn't fill themselves, or they're not the source of their own goodness, okay? Because if he says you're filled with goodness, you could take it, well, see, there's a lot of really good people, right? They're really good people. That's not what he's saying. He's saying they've been filled with goodness. Something happened in the past that caused them to be filled up, continue to be filled with this goodness, and it was something not of themselves. So what is he talking about? Okay, and salvation, all right, right? So he's talking about in salvation, they were filled by what? The very Spirit of God. Think Romans 8, right? We've been talking there. You're not flesh. You're not in the flesh anymore. You're in the Spirit. In fact, if the Spirit of God doesn't dwell there, Spirit of Christ is not there, then you're none of Christ, right? So the Spirit of God has come to take up residence here. To borrow language from Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 and 14, they've been sealed by the Spirit. All right, so there they, this ministry of the Spirit has happened, and so now the Spirit of God, so remember when the, when the rich young ruler came to Jesus and, and said, good teacher, what did Jesus ask him? Why do you call me good? Right? And then his next statement is, there's only one that's good. That's God. So when he says, you're filled with goodness, what is he saying? You've been filled with God. I mean, you know, what's happened? I mean, and I, I put the second question, why do you think he was convinced of this? Well, Paul understands the nature of salvation, right? When somebody gets saved, truly really saved, the Spirit of God takes up residency. That means they've been filled by goodness. Ah, they've been filled by goodness. They've been filled by God himself. I mean, the reason why we can hope to do good is not because we're good people, but we've been filled by the Spirit who is good. The reason why I can hope to love is not because I'm such a loving, kind person. That's not. It's because the Spirit of God is love. And so as the Spirit bears witness, as the Spirit works in my life, then we begin to bear the fruit, the marks of the Spirit. We begin to look more like our Savior. And that's what he's simply saying. He said, I'm convinced of this. I'm satisfied. I'm fully persuaded that you've been filled. That in the moment of salvation, when God saved you, he filled you up with himself. And so now you are characterized by the very character of God himself. You're filled with goodness. Now, those are the kind of people you want to be around, aren't they? Folks, it should be, and this is just a little free application. The people you work with should say, that's a person. That's a good person. And they're going to give credit to you for being that. And you just remember, don't be a glory robber. You say, praise God. God has done this in my life. That kindness or that, that, that response or that, that being honest and not taking advantage of people and not stabbing people to bat, all those things that should be true of you, that goodness comes out isn't because of you. It's because the Spirit of God dwells in you. And so make sure you testify of God's goodness in your life, that, that it is God that is producing that, and that's what Paul is saying about these people. They've been filled with goodness because the Spirit of God dwells in them and the Spirit of God continues. Aren't you glad the Spirit doesn't just come and go? He came to stay. He came to stay and as he comes to stay, he comes to work and to renovate and to pitch out the garbage and cut it out and then to push in uh, righteousness and goodness and the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, all of those things should be coming increasingly evident in my life. Why? Because the Spirit's there. And so they've been indwelled by the Spirit and as a result they are, they're, they're starting to manifest 
the Spirit in their life. And so now Paul is convinced of something. Because this is true, now they've been filled with knowledge, okay? That knowledge is the Word of God. God's Word has obviously come to Rome. They've been taught the Word of God. They're growing in the knowledge of God. So when you have the knowledge of God and you have the Spirit, you've got good things happening, okay? That's why a believer leaving off the Word of God is in real trouble. Because the Spirit uses a means to produce growth in your life, namely the Word, right? Spirit, Word go together, produce fruit. Spirit without the Word, grieve Spirit. Okay? So you have to bring those two together. And so to be filled with the knowledge of God through the revelation of God, the Spirit's the one who's then going to expand your understanding of who God is, who you are, how to live this word out in life. So the Spirit takes the word and then sanctifies us through that word, right? Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. How's that going to happen? By means of the Spirit sanctifying them. So as the Spirit sets us apart, it's by means of the Word. And so to be filled with the knowledge of God through the Word of God, to be, be filled with goodness, the Spirit of God taking it, then you're going to produce some really good fruit. So he says, I'm convinced of this, persuaded, that you've been filled by the Spirit of God, so the Spirit of goodness is in you. You have been received knowledge of God. You have, you've been filled up with knowledge about God. Doesn't mean they know everything, but they have adequate knowledge of God. They've been growing in that relationship. Now he says they're going to be able to do something. What does he say they'll be able to do? He says they'll be able to instruct others. Somebody may have different translation. Anybody, uh, I mean, different tra- ways that is translated. And the ESV says instruct, admonish. Admonish, okay. All right, and the, the verb here is one of Paul's favorites. It's nuthateo, and I know that means a whole lot. Nuos is usually, naos is related to the mind. But here it has a specific reference to avoiding or ceasing an impro- inappropriate course of conduct. So admonish, warn, instruct. Instruct probably is a more neutral term but it really carries more of a warning kind of language in the term. So admonish is a a good translation. Warn would be good. Instruct, as long as we understand it's in the context of the fact that you are being instructed of what to stand against or turn away from. So remember, if you're filled with goodness, you should be able to point out things that are not good and warn people to turn from them, right? Right? And that's one of the ministries we have. We're to, be, we're to admonish one another. We're to instruct. We're to sound warnings. Hey, hey that's not good. That, that's going to have destructive impact in your family. It's going to have destructive influence in your life. That's not something you should be watching. It shouldn't be something you should be participating in. Be careful. What are we doing? The Spirit of God dwells in you. We, 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 we sound warnings. These things are damaging. And so that's all a part of growing, actually. I don't know if I put, I think I put this text up there. Yeah, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, and it's in a context. In fact, one of my, I love preaching the passages in Hebrews uh, chapter 5, where Paul, where Paul <laughs> tips my hand, who I think wrote it, anyway. Uh, so, and he, the author of Hebrews, uh, as he writes there, as he's rebuking his readers for the fact they're not mature like they should be. They should be in a place where they're able to teach others, right? I mean, fulfilling the Great Commission demands that we teach other people. If you never get to the place in your spiritual life where you're able to help other people grow spiritually, you're still a babe and you're not anywhere close to where you need to be. Remember this, you've been called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That means disciples are reproducers, not spectators. There's no room for spectators in the sense of in the calling of God. God hasn't called anybody just to watch. Watch what somebody is doing. No, God's called us to participate in what he's doing and be part of reproducing what he's doing in the lives of others. God's teaching you lessons, putting you in all kinds of circumstances of life and, and graciously working through those both in the times when you blow it totally and when you actually get it right because you're actually yield to the Spirit. God is working in your life to, to, to produce fruit in your life and he's teaching you lessons through those and guess what he intends you to do with them? Teach others. Not to keep it to yourself. That's why he made us a part of a body and he's, and he's called us to serve one another and this is part of the way we do it. And so we've been called to be teachers. Whether you, you may not have the gift of teaching and be formally a Sunday school teacher but no one gets around the obligation of teaching. No one does because we're all disciples. We're all supposed to be engaged and we're engaging lives and different people's lives with the truth of God's word, what God's teaching us and helping others to grow and we need people investing in our lives, don't we? 
Man, you would not be where you are, wherever that is in your own spiritual journey, if someone else hadn't been pouring their life out into the Word and helping you to grow and know it. I mean, I, I would never, you know, I mean, I, I stand on the shoulders of countless men who've invested years of their life to study theology and teach it, and I got to be privileged to sit under them and be taught by them, and not just taught by them in a classroom, taught in all kinds of venues to learn from them, that I could take what they, are, they, what they had learned from God and those lessons they taught and passed on, and then God shapes those in the life of a preacher, and you go on teaching and never stop learning. Never. And as you stand on the shoulders of countless others who've taught and poured into your life, God calls you to do that with others as well. Pour it out. That's why older believers are supposed to be teaching younger believers. And younger believers are to be looking to those who are older in the faith. Not necessarily older than you. Older in the faith. More mature. And be taught by them. Okay? Okay? And that is absolutely essential. And note what he says there. He said, as, as we grow into maturity, something takes place. Our power of discernment grows, is trained by practice of calling things good and evil. Okay, all, I mean, you do this all day long. You constantly call things good and call things evil. Now the question is, are you evaluating those calls by what God has said or just by what it, how it makes you feel? And if you are then saying, you know what, today I called that good and I pursued it, I come back and go, you know what, I'm not sure God would call that good. And I dig in the word and I'm, I'm, I'm looking for biblical principle. Should I have called that good? Is that really good? Now I'm getting my power of discernment trained by the word rather than by how something makes me feel or how it makes me look. I mean, let's face it, we live in a culture that's all about how it makes you look, right? If it makes you look good, then that must be good. If it makes other people impressed by you, it must be good. No, that's not what defines goodness. Remember, you've been filled by the Spirit who is good, who's gonna take the Word of God, which is good, and help us to discern what God calls good. And so I constantly need my discern. I need to grow in discernment. I mean, folks, there's new stuff coming out all the time, right? I mean, you face the bombardment with temptation. Now, they're, they're all rooted in the same kind of realities, but they just dress up differently. Okay, they dress themselves up differently and present themselves to you differently. There's always going to be new nuances of false gospels out there. Always. They have the same core kind of principles behind them, and you pull back a little bit of the masquerade, and you can expose why it's wrong, but they'll always be coming. There's always going to be a false gospel being presented. That you're not going to get around it. There's going to be masquerade Christianity around you all the time. And if you're not careful, you're going to measure yourself by other people who call themselves Christians and say, well, they say that's okay, it must be okay. That's not a very good discernment technique. Okay, you're not going to go very far spiritually if you look at the other guy and say, well, he says that's good and he says that's bad. I better follow that. Okay, I might look at another believer, and Scott wanted me to use an example. I may look at Scott, and I'm going to say, look, I think Scott's doing this right, and I'm going to follow that example. But at the same time, whatever that would be, I would also be saying, you know what, I'm going to examine what Scott's calling good by the word. Because Scott might get it wrong. And I want to follow a godly example. I do want to follow it, but if he's getting it wrong, I want to say, hey, wait a minute. You said this was good. Now, I'm looking at what God's word says, and I'm not convinced. And then you know what we'd need to do? We'd need to study God's word together, wouldn't we? Rather than just argue and fight about it. No, I'm right. No, you're right. I'm right. And, and, and one of the things here is just a free warning, because I've seen this happen in so many believers' lives. You call something right, somebody challenges you on it, you know what you do? What we naturally do, not just you, what we all naturally do. Once I'm convinced something's right, if somebody challenges me on it, what do I do? I get mad at them, right? They're wrong. You're not going to tell me I'm wrong. Why? Because this little ugly thing called pride just goes, bing, right to the top. Because I decided it's right. It must be right. Don't you tell me it's wrong. And we go there that fast because we're sinners. Okay? So that's something you're going to have to fight all your life. Until glory. Yes, Paul. Yeah, because we search the scriptures. Amen. All right. Uh, 
Romans chapter 8 and verse 13 says, if you live according to the flesh, you'll die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And the only reason why I put this up here is not to re-preach something we've talked about, is just say, this is a ministry of the Spirit in your life. If the Spirit's at work in your life, the Spirit of goodness, what is he helping happen in your life? Putting sin to death. That means he's exposing sin. He's growing your power of discernment. He's teaching you to hate what God hates. But again, it happens by a means, by means of the word, by means of worship and instruction in the word. As I grow in the knowledge of the word, the spirit takes that word and helps me to hate what God hates and helps me to love what God loves. And anytime I'm calling something good that God doesn't love, I know that wasn't of the spirit, right? Can't be. So I need my powers of discernment constantly trained. But here's the good news. You're indwelled by the Spirit of God. The Spirit will take the Word of God and will teach you what is good. That's, I mean, folks, you're, you're constantly bombarded with these decisions, right? You're always going to be calling things good and things bad. Well, here's the encouragement. The Spirit of God will take God's Word and help you to make right decisions. Isn't that good news? Okay, you're not always going to get it right. You know why? Because you're still a sinner and you're still enough selfishness and self-absorbed and enough deception in the world that we're going to call things at times good that God doesn't call good. All right? And we need God to expose that and help us see it and then grow through it. So we will call the things good that God calls good. So, but you're filled with goodness. The Spirit of God dwells in you. You're filled with goodness. Now, we need to grow in discernment but then we're also then responsible to take that knowledge that God's growing in us and teach others. All right. Going back to the text in verse 16, he says, to be a minister of, of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. There's that set apart by the Spirit, okay? Ministry of the Spirit, sanctifying believers, sanctify them by Thy truth, thy word is truth, so you can bring those texts together and see sanctification is by word through spirit, all right? Spirit and word come together. But you know what he makes this comparison, right? He makes a comparison about his ministry. Paul's been entrusted with the gospel, gospel to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And he makes this comparison in here of his ministry to what ministry? Okay, to an Old Testament priest, all right? If you were an Old Testament priest, what was your responsibility? What was the priest's responsibility? Are we not sure? No, no idea? Okay, they were to serve in the temple. What were they to do in the temple? Sacrifices. Okay, they were responsible for the sacrifices, right? Now, they had all kinds of priestly vestments. They had all their kinds of the cleansing they had to do. They had everything to, that, that, that they would come in and they would be clean, ceremonially clean. And even in it being declared ceremonially clean, the first thing they had to make an offering for was what? Their own sin, absolutely, because they're still sinners. But they had to make sure they were ceremonially clean because if they weren't ceremonially clean, they were liable to judgment, like death on the spot, okay? So they're coming in to, to present offerings to the people. Now, their whole lives was that, right? Set apart by God to the priesthood. And they, they were, the priesthood was divided up in different divisions and they had some levels of different responsibility depending on time of Israel's history, if there was a tabernacle or not, but all of that. But they had all their different responsibilities, but it was all around the sacrifices and they rotated duties. There would be priests on for so many months and they would rotate the duties because your hand would get tired of cutting all those sheep and everything else up too, all right? So, so they rotated the duties through there and they had to present these offerings. And their life was constantly a life of, of devotion to God, service to God, and presenting the offerings to God, right? Paul now says, hey, my ministry of the gospel is a ministry that's like the priesthood ministry. I have an offering to present to God. That offering of the people God's called me to reach with the gospel. I am presenting an offering to God. And note what he wants about this. He's praying that this offering to God would be what? Acceptable. That God, you called me to this ministry and I'm serving you in this ministry and I have a responsibility as one set apart by God to service to bring an offering. Paul understood that he was bringing an offering. Now Paul understood that every New Testament believer is a priest. The Old Testament priesthood has been done away with, right? 
So I make this statement. How does Paul's statement, how does this help you and I to understand a little bit or give you a little bit of window into the whole issue of the, the priesthood of the believer? Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. All right, well, I mean, we can make several, we can come at it in a couple different angles. One is, as a priest, if, if every new believer is a priest, then we no longer need to go through a priest, right? So there's not, contrary to Romanism, you know, the, the priests there are the interceders, right? They intercede to God, you have to go. That's why you go to confessional and all that other stuff because they're interceding because you're going through a priesthood. Guess what? New Testament priest of the believer says, I knew one needs to stand between me and God, right? That's part of the New Testament priesthood. No one stands, now it doesn't mean that you don't come to an intercessor, you do. You come to an intercessor who himself is God, right? We come to the great high priest, Jesus Christ who is always interceding for us. And so we've been appointed a priest. We come through an intercessor, Christ, because we don't come on our own merits. We don't have any. He has them all. We come on his merits, enter the presence of God through Christ to pray. But I don't need somebody to stand between me and God in that relationship. You don't have to come and ask. I mean, you come and ask me to pray for you. That's a good thing. But if then you aren't praying about the same thing, we've got a problem. Okay, because if you think me praying about it is more valuable than you praying about it, you don't understand the priesthood of the believer. Okay? So, is God is going to hear your prayer just as much as he hears mine? Absolutely. Now, I hope mine might be a little more theologically informed, maybe a little bit, but at the same different, same point is, it doesn't mean I have any better standing. It probably just means I use more flowery language than you do. Okay, so <laughs> that's reality. All right, so the, the, you know, it doesn't mean I have any different standing. I don't. We're priests. But here's the side of it that I haven't often thought about. Maybe you have, I haven't. But a priest never entered the presence of God without what? Without an offering. He never entered the presence of God without an offering. So what offering are you supposed to present every day to God? Don't we have that answer, right? Not that one, sorry. I didn't put it up there, oh well. Romans 12, 1, right? We're to present ourselves a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable act of worship, or it's our spiritual worship, depends on your translation, but it is, it's worship. We are not to come into the presence of God without an offering. And that should, I mean, I, I haven't thought about that a lot. I mean, I have when I preach through Romans 12. But as Paul talks about his ministry uh, uh, as a priesthood, uh, I, I mean, a priestly ministry of the gospel, I thought, wow. And I, that, that he's saying, listen, my, my appointment by God is, is, is like the priesthood's appointment. I've been set apart by God to, to, to do the work of God. And that work is going to present an offering to God, which I pray is acceptable. You bring that transfer right home into the priest of the believer. Reality is, is, folks, we come every day in the presence of God through prayer, don't we? If I'm not entering the presence of God in prayer, then I'm wasting my breath. Or I'm praying to the wall or the, the television or somebody else, whatever, none of which can answer. The whole point of prayer is to bow my head and my heart before the one true and living God who is everywhere present, who because of Christ I can come before a throne filled with grace and ask for the help that I desperately need. So I'm entering the presence of God and when I come in the presence of God I need to be mindful of several things. I have no right there except for Christ. The only reason why I should be accepted is because of what Christ has done. So I come on the basis of what Christ has done and I come to present to God an offering to God that I hope is acceptable, namely my life. God, this life belongs to you. It does not belong to me. It is to be used for your glory. It is not to be used for self-gain. And so I come to you today to ask you to work in light of what you've called me to do and be. And I want my life offering to be acceptable to you. We come presenting an offering. We come every Sunday presenting an offering, don't we? You say your tithe offering? No. Your life offering, which is worship. 
And when we fail to worship, when worship becomes ritual and we simply go through motions, we really don't offer anything to God, then we didn't really worship. We just went through an activity that we all call worship, right? So we come to the presence of God to present to God ourselves as an offering, and we do it every day, and we should do it every day. Contrary to how Romans 12, 1 and 2 have often been preached, this just dramatic time of dedication, it really is the way we're to live our life. And I hope that is a helpful reality for all of us. Last thing we'll do tonight, just verse 18. He says, for I will not uh, venture to speak anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. So I, I think this says something about the nature of conversion. Paul says, I, I, I don't venture to speak anything except what Christ has accomplished. And what Christ has accomplished in the lives of these Gentile now believers is what? They've been saved, and the, result, the evidence of that is what? Obedience. They obey God. You were a rebel against God, and God sent a rescuer, Christ, to rescue from not just the penalty of sin, but from your rebellion, and to bring you into submission to Christ so you would be a follower of Christ, one characterized by obedience to Christ. And this is all accomplished by Christ, right? Salvation is a work of God from beginning to end. You and I can't change hearts, but God, when he saves, changes hearts. And it produces an obedience in both word and deed. It's a transformation of a life. God takes that which was a rebel against him and makes him a saint, characterized by faith. And one of the hallmarks of faith is obedience. Why? Because faith trusts and submits. I trust what you say is good. I submit my heart to your authority. Therefore, I obey. If I don't trust you, I'm not going to obey you because I'm not convinced you're good. If I don't submit and recognize your authority, if I want to play co-equal, then my opinion weighs as much as yours, or I'm bowing to some other authority in my life, but I may not bow to yours. But faith is oriented in a person, Jesus Christ. And that faith in that person is characterized by trust, absolute trust in his sovereignty, that he's in control, and that he's good. And it manifests out with submission because he's Lord, right? He's Lord. He's Absolutely. Obedience is better than sacrifice. But he's Lord. How do you relate to a Lord? You don't compete with them. You bow to them. And he is Lord. And we bow under his authority and not like a crushed under the authority. It's a welcome submission because he of the kind of Lord he is. Because he is gracious, kind, and gentle. gentle. And he is the one who bore our penalty on the cross of Calvary. So I come gladly to follow that Lord because he loves me so. And you know what it's like, even in a, an ordinary workplace, you know what it's like to work for a boss that you respect and you know actually cares about you. And you know what it's like to work for somebody who is a demanding, uh, mean, spirited, constantly put down, doesn't appreciate anybody and is out for only himself and you have that guy for a boss or that woman for a boss. And when you have one of those, life going to work is not fun. You get up every day dreading to go to that workplace because you're like, oh, I gotta go work for that person. I gotta deal with that again. Folks, when I talk about the Lordship of Christ, please don't put that kind of person's picture on Christ. He is the kind of person you gladly follow because he loves you. And so, well, that's... We'll pick up here next time and we'll, we'll weigh into the actual prayer request itself, but there was a lot, of, a lot of stuff I thought was worth pulling out in the backdrop. When you get to verses 22 through 29, you see Paul's itinerary. He's headed to Jerusalem. He's going with an offering from the, people, the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. 
He's going to present that offering and then he's on his way with an intentionality that when he gets to Jerusalem, he's going to present this offering and then he's going to go on to Rome on his way to Spain with the gospel. And then he asked him in light of this plan to pray for him. And then we're, and he's specifically asking for prayer in regard to ministry. And by the way, not all of what Paul asked him to pray about was answered the way he anticipated it to be answered. Okay? And that's a great lesson in prayer. To remember that God answers, but not always in the way we anticipate the answer. And that's part going back to this other thing I just talked about. Remember who your Lord is. He is sovereign. He is good. He always does what's best. He knows what's best. He always does what's best. And so at times God will answer prayer in your life in ways completely unexpected by you. And we'll do it very differently than you would have done it. But you're not God. He is. And he knows exactly what he is doing at all times for your good and his glory. So you can trust him. All right, let's pray.